ladies, welcome to the annual Visitor's Day for Community Bible Study. It is wonderful to see the faces of all of our regular members, our family as we would call them. But it's a real special to treat to see so many new faces. Thank you ladies for inviting friends and spreading the word about this great ministry. We are so glad that you are all here this morning and I'm excited about the prospect of having more people study God's word with us next year. Here at CBS, we are a very diverse group of women in many ways. Our backgrounds, our Bible knowledge, our ages, our church affiliations, and where we are in our walk with the Lord are all different. But we come together every week and we unpack God-breathed, life-changing scripture. And we do it all in an environment of community that is fun and relaxed. And so we're so glad you're here. We, uh, this morning is um, my privilege to get to give you a sneak peek into what we're going to study next year. So before we do that, let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for each woman here. And I pray that you would bring everyone that you would have to be in the study to uh, the decision of reg registering this morning, if it is your will, Lord. Thank you for this glorious day and for your word. In your son's name we pray, amen. So first of all, I'm gonna start with a question. How many uh, moms do we have in the group? Raise your hand if you're a mom. Lots of us. How many grandparents? Okay, we got a lot of grandparents too. So we've got many of us who have been through parenting and some of us who have been through parenting and grandparenting. So let me ask you the question, have you ever, when your child, when you were telling your child to do something or not to do something, have you ever used these words when your child asks why? Have you ever said, because I said so? Anybody? Okay, good, good. I'm glad I'm not alone in that. And usually it quiets them right down, right? And they fall into obedience. They just love it when you say that, right? No. Not so much. When I look back at my parenting, um, and my kids are pretty much all adults now, but believe me, they still need parenting. But when, when I look back at it, um, when I've used those words, it's not many of my proudest parenting moments, not because there's anything wrong with those words, but in reflecting on it, I have found through trial and error, mostly error, uh, that it is better when I've taken the time to explain to my kids why I'm asking them to do something or not to do something. And it, that's just because it helps them get not just what specific behavior is in question at the moment, but it helps them get the bigger picture of what I'm asking for. It helps them get the bigger picture of life in general. And there's a greater chance at that point, I think, that they will gain heart knowledge of what I am talking about rather than just head knowledge. So the Bible is a big picture, uh, a big look at God's work in our lives. And next year, the books that we're going to be studying we're gonna, will provide crucial background and context to help us understand the why of the whole story, the theme, the scarlet thread that runs through the entire Bible, which is God's message of redemption. And I love this. Rather than just because he says so, our ultimate father, God, through the preservation of scripture, has provided a record of his dealings with people from the very beginning of time. And as his character and his plans are revealed to us in these dramatic stories of the Old Testament, we will move from head knowledge to heart knowledge of who God is. The great truths of the New Testament which if you've been with us for the past few years in community Bible study, we've been studying books in the New Testament. Those great truths are really going to come alive for us as we study Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. It's the story of the journey of God's people, the Israelites, from the Red Sea to the Jordan River. It's history, ladies, but it is so much more. So we're going to begin in Exodus where we find the descendants of Abraham enslaved in Egypt. And the title of the book 
captures the main event that happens in the book, their deliverance from slavery and their exodus or their departure from Egypt. You might know the stories of the plagues that God um, put on Egypt. You might have heard the story of the parting of the Red Sea and the Passover meal that was shared just before they left Egypt. In fact, at this time of the year, you're probably hearing about Passover a lot. Do you really understand it all? Ladies, next year, we're going to get the Pinterest Plus version of the Passover meal. Not only are we going to know what all was served, but we are going to understand why it was served. And we are going to see the revelation of God's character in every aspect of that sacred meal. Not only will we know, let's see, where am I? Oh, his justice. Um, in that meal, we're going to see, see his justice revealed um, against human evil and his mercy as he provided uh, the Passover lamb for um, the protection of the Israelites. And that is all foreshadowing of the great Passover lamb that we now know in Jesus Christ. Other significant events that we're going to see in Exodus are the giving of the Ten Commandments and the specific instructions that God gives for the building of his tabernacle. And through these events, God is revealing his, um, he's communicating his standards and he's revealing that his character is pure and holy. And so that brings us to the next book, to Leviticus, because in Leviticus, we're not gonna study the whole book of Levit Leviticus, but we're gonna study some of the chapters. And in that book, we are basically given the blueprint of how sinful people can live in the presence of a pure and holy God. You see, Adam and Eve's sin and our sin um, had a devastating effect on humanity's relationship with our creator. God's presence was no longer with people like it had, had been in the Garden of Eden. But when God gives the Ten Commandments and some other instruction that we um, collectively refer to as Old Testament law or as Mosaic law. When he gives that, he also agrees to dwell with his people again, but not freely as he had walked with them in the Garden of Eden. This time he is going to explain how we can fellowship with him in worship. And so we're gonna learn a lot about worship next year, ladies. This is why God gives detailed instructions for building the tabernacle. Um, God also established the priesthood where representatives of the people would be able to enter in to that tabernacle, the, to the most holy of holy um, parts, um, to rep take representation of the people. We'll learn about purification rituals that God implemented as a way of showing people that they should be set apart and holy because they were his chosen people. This is also where God introduces the sacrificial system. Unblemished, perfect, innocent animals were to be sacrificed according to certain regulations so they would bear the sin of the people and give them forgiveness. And this was something that had to be done, had to be repeated with regularity. Ladies, the, uh, the symbolism, the imagery, and the foreshadowing that is going to unfold in uh, these Old Testament books. It's, it's going to be like the last, the final pages of a suspenseful novel. And every detail is going to point to the hero of that novel, which is Jesus Christ, the one who completely fulfilled the law. He is our one true high priest. The temple is no longer a physical place. It is now our hearts. And Jesus is the one and only final sacrifice for our sins, the perfect Lamb of God. It is going to be a rich, rich studies, ladies. I haven't even gotten to the third book. The final book is Numbers. Uh, by the title of that book, you know that there are going to be some lists and some statistics in that book. But we're going to know the why behind that. And it is to reveal God's character. He is a God of order. And he always has a plan and a purpose. The Hebrew title for that book is probably more descriptive. It means in the wilderness or in the desert. And that's really what this is. It's an epic travel log of the Israelites as they were in the desert for 40 years. And as Leslie 
said when she introduced this study a few weeks ago, this trip from the Red Sea to the Jordan River, it should have taken them about two weeks. But it took 40 years, ladies. And that is a lesson for the Israelites and for us that if we choose to live in rebellion and complaining and disbelief, there will be consequences. God will honor our choices and there will be consequences. The extra years and the, hard, the hardships that they encountered during those 40 years were um, God's discipline. But even though the people were unfaithful, God was always faithful. He provided food in the form of manna and quail, and he provided continual guidance uh, in the form of the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Rest assured, when we study these Old Testament books, we're going to see the big picture of God at work in history. And we are going to be inspired by the example of Moses, who played such a big role in carrying out God's plan. We're going to see that uh, despite Moses, his doubts, his own self-doubts about his being equipped for this role, we're going to see that God was with him and did equip him every step of the way for this monumental task of leading his people. The life application and opportunity for spiritual growth will abound next year as we touch on these themes. Doubt and faithfulness, complaining and grace, crisis and intercession, failure and repentance. Suffice it to say that I think we have a great study ahead of us, and I hope that each one of you will be here to join us with us, um, join us next year as we study Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. For now, I want to uh, go ahead and dismiss our core members and guests. We want to welcome you. Our core members are going to go out th these doors to core groups. Guests, if you will go out these doors and then take a right and an immediate right into the parlor, we are going to greet you in there. We'd love for you to get some food. There's food in there. Get some coffee, a water, and then have a seat. And we will uh, give you some more information about the class and allow you to ask some questions. So you have a good morning, everybody. Well, we want to just say what a terrific morning we've had today, our annual Visitor's Day. We want to thank our members for inviting your friends and neighbors and family to come and join us here at Community Bible Study. We have had a tremendous turnout this morning. We are so excited to add to and grow our family here at CBS. So to all of you new ladies who will be joining us in the fall, welcome. We're glad you're here. Our children this morning have a great lesson. They are studying what we will all be celebrating this coming Sunday, and that is Palm Sunday. And they, are, they had a play this morning, and they went out into the courtyard out here, and Jesus was riding on a donkey. It wasn't really Jesus, and it wasn't really a donkey. But, um, but we were make-believe, and we were pretending. And so Jesus was riding his donkey, and the little ones, our kids, all had palm branches, and they were waving their palm fronds and singing praises to the Lord. And what they're learning from the lesson this morning is that they should be singing praises to Jesus. What a great lesson they have. Well, I thought this morning that I would begin with a little video. I am not going to give it into any introduction other than to say it's not about the nail. Let's watch. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And... I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head, and it's relentless, and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop they, trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, 
sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. It's not about the nail. The nail was the obvious problem, right? But the underlying issue was a communication problem, correct? So it's not always about what is obvious in front of us. And I'm going to tag on to that thought this morning as we look at Paul on trial in front of the Roman governor, Felix. Because you see, he's on trial and they bring up these charges and they lay them against him. But that's not really what this trial is about. Again, it's not about the nail. It's not about the actual charges they bring against him. This trial make no doubt about it, is about Paul's faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his unwavering determination to tell everybody he runs into about his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why Paul is on trial. So it's not about the nail. But the problem that we're going to see this morning as we go through the scriptures is that Everybody who has presented the gospel message does not necessarily respond favorably. So we'll see that everybody has to come to a response and a decision about the resurrection. And that's what we'll see. We'll see three different responses this morning as we go through the text. And so I just want to ask you as we go through this morning the lesson, what has been your response to the resurrection and... Will you choose to share the gospel with everyone who will listen to you? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for these scriptures that you've given us. And we thank you most importantly for the resurrection and what that has done in our lives and given us new life. Father, I pray that you will be with me as I speak. Get me out of your way so that your words will be heard and understood. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so as we open chapter 24, I've already told our visitors if they wanted to skim chapter 24, um, they could do that. But they're a little bit behind our members who have done your homework, right? I told them about homework, so I'm sure you all did your homework and you had a great discussion this morning. But we find that Paul is in Caesarea. So we have a map. I'm going to try not to fall off the stage this morning. I should have pulled this closer. This is in the back of your books, ladies. Um, Jerusalem is down here. He's made his way just 65 miles to Caesarea. Now, this map is a map to Rome, right? And we remember last week, the Lord appeared to Paul and said, you will be my witness in Rome. You're going to Rome, and you're going to speak the gospel in Rome. So Paul knows this is his destination, but he hasn't made it very far. Remember how he got there last week. He, um, the Jewish leaders there in town, they plot to kill him, to silence him. About They don't want him talking about the resurrection anymore. And so they devise this big old plot. But the Roman, the Roman tribune there in Jerusalem sneaks Paul out of town under 472 armed guards surround Paul. And they go to Caesarea, okay, where Paul is going to wait for his trial. Now, where they take him in Caesarea is not just any local jail in Caesarea. They take him to Herod's palace, okay? And this is so amazing. For those of you who have been with us, um, you know that I have been bragging about my recent trip to Israel and the Holy Land. Tom, my husband and I went uh, back at the, turn, at the turn of the year, over the new year, and one of my favorite places, we went to Caesarea and we stood on these very grounds where Herod's, the, the ruins of Herod's palace now, so let me just show you. We have this first shot. It's an aerial shot. This is from looking at the Mediterranean Sea. I did not take this. I didn't take my drone on vacation with me to take this shot. I stole this off the internet. But if you're out in the Mediterranean Sea looking at Caesarea, this area all in here would have been his palace. 
He built an amphitheater, which is still standing to this day, which we sat in. Um, they would hear speakers and plays there. And then this is a hippodrome, which is still par partially standing, where they would have horse races and chariot races and all that kind of stuff. So cool. But the remains of the palace are very few. But let's look at the next picture. This is my, my photo. This is standing on the remains of the palace, looking out to the sea. Y'all, the palace was so amazing that Herod built. This is the remains. He had built an indoor freshwater swimming pool, and this is the remains of that swimming pool. Is that not cool, right? Right? So it was one of my favorite places, just knowing that we were studying Paul at the time when I was there. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is where this is so cool. Anyway, so, again, you get to see my vacation pictures. So, sorry. So Paul's a prisoner. He's in this palace in Caesarea. And he's been there for five days, and now the entourage from Jerusalem comes bringing the charges against him. And this entourage is made up of the high priest, Ananias, and we learned last week that Ananias is not a good guy. Although he's a high priest, he's a very bad man. He is ruthless, he is corrupt and despicable, and he has a determined hatred for not only Paul, but for the entire Christian church. High priest brings with him some, um, some of the Sanhedrin, some of the Jewish council, the Supreme Court members, basically. And he brings with him these guys and a guy by the name of Tertullus. And this is the first time we've ever been introduced to Tertullus. Now, Tertullus was, <coughs> excuse me, a paid spokesman. And he was there to persuade Felix, the governor, of, to um, convict Paul. Okay. Now, he's not there to speak the truth because he doesn't, and he's not there to lay out facts because he doesn't. He's a persuader, and so he's just there to try and persuade, and he has, he's a very gifted uh, rhetorical speaker, Okay, so that's what he's there for. Now, Tertullus begins making his case against Paul, and he lays it on, y'all read, and nauseatingly thick. I mean, it's sappy sweet, right? It's just like, oh, seriously, are you kidding me? And it reminded me, y'all, some of y'all aren't old enough to remember um, Eddie Haskell. And um, yeah, yeah. Oh, Mrs. Cleaver, you look so beautiful today, Mrs. Cleaver. Yeah, so it, it kind of reminded me of that, trying to butter him up. So this is the words that um, Tertullus uses, verses 2 through 3. And when he, Paul, had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you, O governor, Felix, you, we enjoy much peace, and, sight, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. So not only is the flattery very obvious, right, they're just trying to butter him up, but what, they, what Tertullus says is a complete lie, because everybody in the room knows that Tertullus hates the Jews, and the Jews hate Tertullus. And so he's saying, oh, you brought such peace to our people. Well, that's a lie. The only way that there was any semblance of peace is because Felix has had the dissidents, the Jewish people that would stand up to him, he has them murdered, okay? And they say, oh, you have brought such great reforms to our nations, no, he, had, he has brought reforms that benefit him personally, and it's done through political extortion, okay? And so this whole beginning is not good. It's just a sham of a trial, okay? So the trial is, but remember, the trial is not about the nail. It's not about the charges that we're going to read. The trial is about Paul's faith and his belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Okay? So Tertullus begins, verses 5 through 6. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. Okay, so let's just go through these charges one by one. First charge, that um, Paul is a plague. Some translations may have, your translation may have said he's a pest. And he, this pest is going around stirring the Jews in all the world into a riot. So we read that and we think, what is the crime in being a pest? I mean, is that a crime really to be a pest? But 
this would have really resonated with Felix, the Roman governor, because Felix is charged with making sure all of this Judean province doesn't get out of hand. They don't get out of line. And if there's a revolution or a revolt or anything like that on the back burner and bubbling up, he is there to tamp that down because we don't want anything getting to Rome that we're having problems over in Judea. So if there is word or whispers about a riot against the empire, this would have been a big concern for Felix. That's why Tertullus leads with this charge. The second charge, he's a ringleader in the sect of the Nazarenes. In other words, Tertullus is saying he is a religious radical. Now, at the time, back in this first century, Christianity, or the way, they called him the way, right? The way was in the same basket as Judaism, as far as the Romans were concerned. The Romans didn't want all these new religions popping up. But, remember a few months ago, maybe, we read that um, Rome approved of Christianity because it fell under the um, the cover of Judaism, right? Because it was kind of birthed out of, well, not kind of, it was birthed out of Judaism. And so that was the charge. But Tertullus says, no, 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 no. He's trying to start a new religion. And all these fanatics, and they're going to come with all their enthusiasm, and they're going to just, it's going you know, to stir up a hornet's nest. And you don't want them starting this new religion. And so Felix's ears kind of perk up at that. No, because we need to tamp that down, right? The third charge is that he desecrated the temple. Tertullus is referring to what we studied a few weeks ago when those Asian Jews came to town and they said he's brought a Greek into the temple, right? And we, it made me wonder why would Felix, this Roman governor, what does he care who goes into the temple? It does no skin off his teeth. What does it matter to him? Well, he knows that the temple is so sacred to the Jews if there is kind, any kind of disturbance up there that's going to inflame the people that could possibly riot, then this is of concern to him. Again, he's trying to tamp down the, the, the people and make sure that they don't revolt or riot. And so this would have been a concern to him also. But all three of these charges that have been leveled against Paul, they're all false charges. But nonetheless, the proceedings continue. So Paul stands up. And he is so gracious and so calm, and it says he cheerfully gave his defense. Good thing I wasn't there. I would have stood up and said, you bunch of liars. That's not fair. But that's not what he does, right? He stands up, and he's gracious, and he's cheerful in his defense. Charge number one. He says, as far as inciting a riot, he basically says, hey, Felix, why don't you check your calendar? <laughs> I didn't, I, I've only been in town a few days. I hadn't had time to stir up a riot. And before that, I've been out of the country for years. I don't even know some of the people in Jerusalem anymore. So th there's no facts to this. You, th there's no one who can come here and say, I was stirring up a riot because it just didn't happen. So he demolishes the first charge. Second charge, he says, as far as um, being a religious radical, I guess I'm guilty as charged. If, if you want to say that I'm the leader of the way, yeah, that, yeah, I'll take that every day. But what I want you to know, Felix, Mr. Roman Governor, is that what the way, what we believe, is the same thing as what these Jews standing over here accusing me believe. I believe in the law. I believe in the prophets. I believe when the Old Testament talks about the resurrection of the dead. I believe it all. I've just taken it one step further, and I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says, is, what, what crime does that break? That what, have I broken any Roman law there? Absolutely not. So he blows that charge out of the water. And the third and final charge of desecrating the temple. His argument is very simple here. He just says, look, I didn't go to desecrate the temple. I went to worship in the temple. And everybody that saw me there saw me worshiping. They saw me purifying myself. They saw me. I didn't come to destroy it. I came. I brought alms to help build it up. And he says, and by the way, where are those people that said I was desecrating the temple? Let's look around the room. Are they here? Nope. 
They didn't show up for the trial because they know they can't stand there and say, yeah, he was desecrated in the temple because it's all a lie. He didn't do that. And so with that, Paul pretty much blows up the whole argument that the Jews brought forward, right? But remember, it's not about the nail. It wasn't really about those charges. And Paul's about to tell Felix, the man that is judging him, what this trial is really all about. Verse 21, this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. So Paul basically says that there is one reason and one reason only that I'm standing right here and you're judging me. It's because of my faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and it's because I won't shut up <laughs> and talking about it. They can't silence me. I'm going to keep screaming it everywhere I can go. I'm going to keep spreading the gospel message. And by inference, Paul is saying, look, I'm on trial here because they don't like what I'm saying. They don't believe what I'm saying. They have rejected my message. And so that brings us to our first response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Jewish leaders rejected the truth of the resurrection. Now, these leaders had heard Paul speak before. They had heard the Christian leaders in Jerusalem speak about Jesus and his resurrection. They knew the story and they knew the truth, but their hearts were so hard and so calloused that they rejected all of that truth. And ladies, scripture is very, very clear. Anyone who rejects the truth of the resurrection will spend an eternity separated from God, okay? So that's our first response. They rejected the resurrection. So Felix has heard all the evidence. He's heard both sides of the story. And he says, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna wait for Lysias. Remember, he was the Roman commander from Jerusalem. We're gonna wait for Lysias to come down here and then he can fill us all in and we'll get the facts straight. Well. This was just a stalling tactic. This was just putting off making a decision. Because if you remember back, if you read the fine print from last week, when Lysias sent Paul to Caesarea, he sent with him a letter exonerating Paul of all the charges. So Felix already has an exoneration. He knows that he's innocent, but he's not going to make a decision as to what to do with Paul. He's just going to sit on the fence for a while, okay? But hey, the good news is, Paul, uh, he's, he's in a, I think from everything I read, a, if you're going to be in prison, this is a pretty cush prison, right? <laughs> Being in a palace, I, you know, I don't know if he got to go swimming in the indoor swimming pool or not, but he's not in a hole in the ground like we've seen him before when he's been in prison. Um, and, and he has a lot of liberties there um, while he's pretty much under house arrest. He's, his friends can come visit him and bring him notes of encouragement. And, and so it, it's, if you're going to be in jail, this is a pretty good place to be. So let's take a minute to talk about this Felix guy before we get further into the text. Who is Felix? Because in just reading the scriptures, it's a little difficult to determine which direction he's going. But we have a lot of secular history that also confirms that Felix was not a good guy, okay? So, who is he? Well, he succeeded Pontius Pilate. You may remember Pontius Pilate, okay? So he, after Pontius Pilate left office, he is now, Felix is now the Roman governor of Judea, okay? Felix has been in control for five years when we meet him here. He will last in office another two years before he is recalled by Rome, okay, because he is incompetent. Okay, so um, this is so fascinating. This is, I just love this part of the story. It said that his wife, he had a wife, um, Drusilla, you read that, and she was Jewish. Well, he had been married before several times. She had been married before several times. His first wife, we don't know a lot about. His second wife was the granddaughter of Anthony and Cleopatra. How fascinating is that? 
And now this is his third wife. He had an affair with her. He dumped his wife. She dumped her husband. And now they have come together. So what about Drusilla? What is she? We, all, the scripture tells us is that she's Jewish. Well, we know from history, her granddaddy, Herod the Great, tried to have Jesus killed in Bethlehem when he was a baby, right? Her uncle, Herod the Tetrarch, had John the Baptist murdered. Her daddy, Herod Agrippa I, had the apostle Paul killed. So when it says, this is my personal interpretation, when it says there that Felix was acquainted with the way and he knew about Christians, I think he knew about Christians because he, he knew his wife's family killed a lot of them, okay? So this is, this is how he's familiar with Christians. Personally, Felix was completely devoid of ethics. Um, he would hire thugs to eliminate even his friends if they got in his way politically. Um, in short, he was a brutal an incompetent politician, okay? It's not good. So days after the trial is over, the scriptures tell us that Felix calls Paul to come, come talk to me and my wife about your faith. And what an opportunity. Paul is never one to shy away from sharing the gospel, right? And so Paul goes and he says he talks about three different things. He talks about righteousness. He talks about, uh, wait, wait. Help me, self-control, yeah, self-control. And he talks about um, the coming judgment. So I'm sure that, I don't know exactly what Paul said, but I'm sure he spoke the truth and didn't hold back. When you talk about righteousness, that, that term is just a fancy term for being made right with God. And I'm sure he said the only way to make, be made right with God is when you fall under the blood of Jesus Christ and you surrender to his leading in your life. And then he talks about self-control. If ever there's two people that need self-control, it's, it's Felix and Drusilla, right? And so I'm sure he told them, hey, the way that you can have self-control is when you do come to a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells you, and then the Spirit gives you the self-control to hold back on some of that sinful impulse, impulse that you have. And then he talks about the coming judgment. And I'm sure this is where he laid it on and said, look, I want to I level with you. I want to be really honest with you. Unless you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you will be um, eternally separated from the Lord. But if you come into relationship with him, believing in the resurrection, then you will spend eternity in heaven with your father. When Paul had finished talking, scripture tells us that Felix is shaken in his boots, Right? He is scared to death about what he has just heard. And he says, get away, go away from me. If I want to call you again, I'll call you again. And we see that he does call him back. He calls him back because he's curious. He's curious about the cross. He, he wants to investigate the resurrection. He wants to see what this is all about. But ladies, that curiosity, it must be followed up with a decision. Or else you're in the same boat as those who reject Christ. And so this brings us to our second response to the resurrection. Felix only went so far as investigating the truth of the resurrection. Paul had held the cup of truth to Felix's lips, but he wouldn't drink the living water. And so Felix, like so many people, postponed his decision. He put it off for another day. Why? We don't know. But many people, maybe you, are postponing making a decision about the resurrection. I heard a little story about procrastinating. Once upon a time, Satan called together his demons. And he said, there are too many people coming to know Christ. I need to know a way to stop them. We need to come up with a formula to stop them. And so the first demon said, well, I'll go down to earth and I'll tell them that the Bible is all fake. And Satan said, no, that's not going to work. Another demon says, okay, I will go down to earth and I'll tell them there isn't a God, there isn't a Savior, there isn't a heaven, there isn't a hell. And Satan said, no, that's not going to work either. And the third demon stands up and he says, okay, I'm going to go down to earth and I'll tell them there is a God, there is a Savior, there is a heaven, and there is a hell. But you don't have to make up your mind today, you can just... Put that off 
for another day. Ladies, Satan doesn't have to convince us to reject the gospel. All he has to do is convince us to put it off to a more convenient time. And that's exactly what he's done here with Felix. Here's a man with the opportunity of a lifetime. The apostle Paul is in his presence. And yet he refuses to make a decision. He puts it off. He procrastinates. And make no doubt about it. Procrastinating or delaying a decision about the resurrection is the same as rejecting the resurrection. But we don't ever stop. We see Paul doesn't stop just because he's, they, he's rejected and no, he, the, Felix didn't believe in him. He keeps going back and preaching the gospel. And for two years he's in prison there. And he keeps preaching the gospel to everybody who will listen. Not just Felix. He's preaching it, I'm sure, to the guards and to the fellow prisoners and the people bringing him food and water. I mean, he cannot help but preach the truth of the resurrection. This is who he is because the resurrection has given him new life. It's amazing. So this is the third and final response we see to the resurrection, and that is Paul's. Paul believed the truth of the resurrection. Ladies, we're about to celebrate Easter here in a few days. And if you go to Target or Walmart or any of the stores, you would think that Easter is all about bunnies and jelly beans and pretty little pastel Easter dresses, right? And that is what the world wants to tell you, that Easter is about the bunny. But remember the video? It's not about the nail, and Easter isn't about the bunny. Easter is about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And every single one of us is going to have to respond to the resurrection. What is your response to the resurrection today? And will you choose to share the gospel with all who will listen? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much that you give us these scriptures. And I pray that each woman here has responded favorably to the resurrection and surrendered to you. If there is one woman here this morning that has not, I pray that today would be the day that she would stop putting it off and she would come into faith with you. Father, we love you and um, we thank you for this time. Is it in Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Thank you, ladies, and thank you for visiting with us this morning.